Hey everybody, welcome or welcome back to Dogs 101. I'm your host Nick, and so as always the disclaimer, I'm not a, uh, you know, professional. I was at one point for, you know, dog training and, uh, you know, grooming briefly, but most of this is just me working 10 years at a pet store, seeing the kind of stuff that comes along. So today we're going to be talking about breeds, but I am not going to get into each and every single different specific type of dog breed. That's going to be you know, another video for another day or if ever. Um, there's just so many. Um, I'm more going to be talking about uh, the importance of considering a breed when you're going to buy. Um, <clears throat> I guess the most common example that I could probably come up with is uh, how many husky owners, you know, get them because they have the gorgeous blue eyes, you know, the crazy good coloring, you know, they make the, some of the cutest puppies and they were a dog that you just got to consider what a dog's originally bred for. So a husky was originally bred to be pulling a sled for about 12 hours a day. And quite often, you're not going to be able to fulfill those requirements that the dog has in its body. So that can lead to destructive behavior, very mouthy. Um, and when I say mouthy, I, I mean not just, you know, trying to get their mouth on everything, but also just doing a lot of talking at you. <clears throat> Um, you know, uh, barking huskies and, uh, you know, destructive huskies, very, very common. And it's just because, you know, how, how are you going to work out all of the energy that's been bred into them over the, uh, you know, years? So, you know, I, I know that, uh, you know, it's really tough to, to see a gorgeous puppy and just have that be the deciding factor. Oh, they're so cute. Oh, they liked me. You know, I mean, you know, I, I get it, but at the same time, you know, you got to consider the entire dog's uh, lifetime, you know, when you're considering different breeds. So, you know, yeah, most dogs initially were bred for uh, specific type of jobs. So if you get a dog that was, you know, the type of breed... So uh, let's backtrack real quick and just say, I always recommend mixes because, um, you know, it's a little controversial, but, it, you know, purebred means inbred, you know. And so quite often, if you're going to try and go with a uh, purebred dog with papers... Um, they are going to potentially have a lot of uh, con congenital health issues that have, you know, kind of crept up over the years of uh, having to breed with a similar uh, type of dog. Um, so, you know, like, for instance, just, you know, off the top of my head, uh, you know, some of the larger breeds like Golden Retrievers and, um, you know, German Shepherds often need, like, you know, four hip surgeries, you know, in their lifetime. Um, <clears throat> quite a few of the uh, the toy breeds, the, the, the small breeds, the ones that are bred for, you know, either... Uh, size or you know um you know squished face so obviously the first one most people think of would be like you know pugs and and ones of that uh, nature um they can often have <clears throat> health issues because all they were bred for was was their size or you know getting a squished face well squished face dogs always have um big breathing issues and therefore usually weight issues so for instance it's very very rare to see an adult uh, pug that is nice and lean and trim because um, you, you just start walking them and then pretty soon they can't get the air into their lungs fast enough. They start doing the, you know, and they, they have to stop. They get overheated really easily. They're not able to cool down. So, um, getting them to work off the meal that they had is notoriously difficult. So, um, you know, and, and from what I hear with pugs, it is getting better. They're actually starting to get the nose to come out a little bit more for the standard breed, which is great because, you know, um, I get that they look cute, you know, and I guess, I guess the idea behind that is that the... The less of a big schnoz that they have, like you expect with big dogs, then um, the more human-like they, they appear. They have, a, you know, more of a flat face like we do, and that's the appeal, I, I guess. I mean, you know, it is what it is, but, you know, um, with large breeds, you know, uh, just, just the opposite. So, like, you know, small breeds, you know, um, you know, they, they'll have, you know, some health issues just because there was health and behavior issues because they're solely bred for size. So, for instance, chihuahuas have, um, they're notorious for being a very brave and sociable puppy, but then when they're an adult, they just run and hide from anybody that isn't their pet parent. And, you know, that's because, well, they were never bred for temperament. They were just bred to be, you know, able to fit inside of a handbag. So, you know, usually they end up getting to be very attached to one sole person. Most people actually do seem to get chihuahuas because, like, they make a great, you know, third floor apartment dog, meaning they can usually get out, you know, enough of their energy in a day and be trained to use a dog potty and they don't see many people besides the ones that occasionally, you know, come, come over. So, um, you know, you get, you got to consider, you know, it's like, I mean, how much am I going to have to socialize? How much am I going to have to exercise? Um, what behaviors do I already expect to have be a thing and, you know, to work around that? So what I was about to get into is, you know, so for instance, you know, with, uh, 
you know, dogs that have a, a purpose like herding dogs. A herding dog, you're going to have issues with, uh, if you have kids, they're going to try and corral them. If you're walking away, they'll come up behind you and start nipping you on the ankles. It's something that they were trained to do for in the herding sheep, but they're not having any sheep to herd, so they're going to try and herd you. So you have to be prepared to deal with that, um, you know. So, yeah, I mean, basically, you know, the reason why I'm doing this video is because, you know, it, it, it kind of all started when I would see, you know, I was working in Arizona, and I would see uh, huskies come in, and I would be like, that's like a, a winter dog. Like, why, why would you do that? Well, look at the eyes. You know, one's one's brown, one's, one's blue. <clears throat> And, you know, like the poor things would be suffering. And then the, the worst part is that then people would try and bring in their husky during the summertime to shave them down because they're like, well, all that fur, you know, they're going to be overheated. And, and it's actually the opposite. With the husky, that, that big fat coat, it's super thick. It's actually it works as insulation, both against the cold, but also the heat. If you shave down a husky in, during the summer, they'll actually overheat better than if you didn't shave them down at all. So, you know, each dog, different types of coats different types of things, you know, so for instance, I got to throw a jacket on, uh, you know, Lilu the Loud, because she's a flat coat. She has barely nothing between her skin and the air, and so she needs to have her winter jackets on in the, in the wintertime. In fact, she loves it. She, she realizes, ooh, the thing that makes me feel warm, and then, you know, helps put it on, <clears throat> whereas with a husky, um, you know, you could be potentially trapping, you know, um, you know, moisture in between the, uh, you know, fur and the jacket, and you could actually, like, you know, ruin its, you know, uh, its, its cold, you know, capabilities. So, you know, you usually should never have to put a jacket on a, uh, on a husky. Having said that, you know, yeah, they do have a big thick coat <clears throat> and in the summertime. It is very easy for them to get, you know, warm. So, you know, just c c things to consider, you know, when you're doing the uh, different breeds. So, you know, um, herding breeds are going to have herding tendencies, so it's going to be something to, you know, get over. Um, you know, it's funny because, like, you know, with German Shepherds, uh, a lot of people think, oh, German Shepherd, well, they use as police dogs, so they must be really smart. And yes, they are, but they, they're, they're a weird one because they're actually very easy. It's very easy for them to forget um, their, their training. So even though they're very smart and they pick up on training really quickly, they also, if, you know, you don't keep up with it, um, they'll completely just, you know, forget it. In fact, when I was a dog trainer, it was funny that uh, German Shepherds were kind of like my unicorn when it came to that. I always had a hard time trying to get them uh, interested in the training. Um, you know, most of them, you know, and, and again, I'm projecting human stuff onto them, but it's just, you know, like most of them seem to have a chip on their shoulder, weren't really interested in the treats. Um, you know, there's nothing to shepherd, so they didn't really, you know, care for what I was bringing to the table. So it was funny that, you know, the few victories that I had, you know, the German Shepherds were always uh, a big win in my case, because, you know, people come in thinking it's just like, well, come on, you know, like th 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 these are supposed to be smart dogs, you can't even train them. And it's just like, well, you know, the type of training that I would do, positive reinforcement with treats, you know, they didn't seem to respond to as well. So, um, and, oh yeah, you know, definitely with the uh, the large breeds, um, the, the, the larger the breed, the, the shorter the lifespan. And also like a lot of people want to use, like for instance, with shepherds, I mean, these guys can get agile. They can get agile to the point where they can jump like a six foot fence, you know, like it was nothing. But if that's what you wanted to get them for was doing agility stuff, most people don't realize that you actually can't start agility training with a large dog until they're a year and a half because they need to finish growing. They need to have those bones get nice and thick and set uh, before you, you know, start subjecting them to all the uh, trauma that's involved in the agility training. So, you know, yeah, you basically have a, a, a year and a half of no agility and then only a few years after that before they become, you know, older and then you shouldn't be doing agility because it's just going to be, again, more surgeries on the, uh, on the joints. So... Yeah, you know, it's, um, it's, it's something to consider, but, you know, one of the biggest ones that I, that I, uh, hate is some of the breeds that, you know, people have prejudice against. So, you know, for instance, if you see a Rottweiler, you know, somebody might cross the street. Well, I think the only thing that's valid with a Rottweiler is that, um, it's very rare, but there is a thing that, um, I, I believe what it is is that their, their, their brain continues to grow even though their head stops growing. Uh, and so, like, after three years of being the most loving, loyal dog, they could suddenly, um, you know, have behavior issues that are, you know, un unfixable because it's actually literally, you know, uh, brain damage, you know, not, 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 not a learned behavior that you can unlearn. So I, I've always said that. It's just like there's no dog that's untrainable. It doesn't matter the age. It doesn't matter, um, you know, the, the history. Unless they literally have brain damage, they are able to come back around. It might take longer for some than others, but, you know, they always can. But if it's something that has to do with the brain injury, so, for instance, if a, you know, dog was used as a bait dog, if you don't know what that is, it's, it's unfortunate, but, you know, let, let's say that you uh, train dogs to fight each other, 
and you have one that isn't really that good of a fighter, well, then you'll just use that dog for the fighting dog to train on. So you'll bind up the, you know, the mouth so that it can't bite back, and just it'll be the victim dog. And it's a horrible thing, but uh, oftentimes dogs that come back from that um, don't come back all the way because they actually get enough knocks that now they have neurological damage. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, it is what it is. Most of those, it's probably just best to, you know, put down. I don't mean to get negative on this, but this is a show that doesn't pull punches. And so I want you to know exactly what you're getting into with these guys. And, uh, yeah, you might have, you know, that, that husky that cost you a couple thousand is probably going to cost you in the tens of thousands of uh, property damage because you're not able to, you know, do that much exercise. Um, if you have, like, a, you know, a dog that was bred as a bird dog, um, you're going to have, you know, uh, soggy rolls of socks because every time that you come to the, uh, you know, come home, they greet you at the door with a roll of socks in their mouth because in instinctively they're like, oh, I'm supposed to, you know, be bringing something to you so that you're proud of me. So, you know, my, uh, uh, one of my buddies growing up had a, um, had a, uh, a Brittany dog and that, and that was her favorite thing. So they actually had a designated roll of socks just for, for the dog. So, you know, quirky behavior that comes from, you know, their upbringing. So that's why I like mixed because they usually don't have as many health issues as, as a uh, purebred does, but they also don't have the desires of what they, so say that they're mixed with like, you know, a, a hound and a pointer. If it was just pure hound, then they're probably gonna do a lot of baying. You know, they're gonna be like, you know. Um, but if they're mixed with a hound and a pointer, then, you know, if they do have a barking issue, it might be easier to train them out of it because like only like half their DNA is telling them, hey, hey, bark, bark, bark. Um, you know, so, you know, that that's one reason why I, I do like mixed, but also because you know, they, they often get overlooked in shelters. A lot of times people are looking for a specific breed because their dad and their dad's dad had that kind and, you know. And uh, I'm also not knocking purebred. You know, there's a lot of really good breeders out there. Do, do your research because there's also some scumbags out there as well. But there's some really good breeders that do everything right. And yeah, you're going to have to pay a lot because if you look at the cost of getting them properly, you know, raised, uh, you know, ra bred, raised, you know, like you, you're, you're paying attention to, you know, like where the you know, like where the sources are coming from for the mom and dad, say, uh, making sure that they're good breeding stock, they don't have too many, you know, um, you know, genetic abnormalities. Uh, it's going to cost a lot, and, and especially if you're going to be using them for the specific reason that they're originally bred. You know, so for instance, I have a really good friend. He spent about a year waiting to find the uh, a, a chocolate lab because he was, in fact, planning on using it to go hunting. So, you know, it was a Labrador Retriever. He was planning on having it as a Labrador Retriever. So he was willing to go for the extra cost, the extra energy that this dog was going to exhibit. Like, he, he knew what he was getting into. Like, he had plenty of time to research. And, you know, more power to him. You know, that dog is awesome. And he definitely does right by it. And from what I understand, um, you know, it, it's a great hunting companion, you know. So, you know, definitely don't think that I'm trying to, you know, badmouth anybody that has a purebred or whatever. I just... I prefer it if you're going to use them for what that breed originally was for. I mean, like, Border Collie. Oh, my God. You know, like, unless uh, un unless you have that, you know, specifically for doing, like, you know, um, you know, Agility Frisbee and or what they're originally for, you know, herding. I mean, that that is a dog that just has so much intelligence and so much, um, you know, uh, energy that, it, you know, for just having it for a companion dog, not the best idea. So... Um, you know, I, and especially like, you know, so I, let's get back to the small breeds real quick. So a lot of dogs uh, were bred for size, but a lot of the small breeds, most people don't realize they were actually bred for a job. So for instance, a Yorkshire Terrier, most people get them because they have the long hair, they can put it up in a bun, they look really cute, they're nice and compact, but those were Terriers. They were originally, you know, used for, um, you know, like uh, digging up, you know, like, you know, rodents and stuff, you know, pests. And so, you know, if you have a Yorkshire Terrier, and all of a sudden, they just dug a um, hole in your very expensive bed that you just bought. Well, there's a reason. It's because, you know, we have hardwood floors. They have nothing they can dig. They have the instinct to dig. They feel like that's why you have them in, in the household is to dig. And if they have nothing else, then they'll, you know, possibly rip up your couch cushions, your, your bed. Um, yet another reason why I think that it's always a good idea not to let the dogs up on the couch or on the bed. I know that that's, you know, one of the reasons why a lot of you get one is so that you can cuddle with them. But, um, you know, if a dog thinks that, that that's their domain that they're allowed in and they have some of those digging instincts in them, unfortunately, they might destroy a very expensive, uh, you know, couch and or uh, bed. So, you know, anything that has the terrier at the end of it, you know, they were bred for, you know, purpose, not just for size. Um, you know, so some of them were just literally bred for size, like like the pug, like I was saying earlier, you know, was bred for the size and for the, you know, squish face. Um, so, you know, dachshunds, you know, they, uh, you know, 
again, those are the ones are going to have like, you know, a lot of back issues, but they were also, you know, bred for purpose, you know? And so, you know, they, they need to have, you know, um, uh, so yeah, real quick, you know, just if you've been with me during all this stuttering and hemming and hawing, um, a cool little tip is if you do have a digging dog, then, um, you know, you can actually set up a designated place that they can dig, you know, it's, it's actually, uh, not a bad idea. So, you know, you, uh, set up an area, um, that they have dug that you don't mind that they dig at. So obviously not near any fencing, you know, or whatever, but then you, um, you know, dig down a little bit, throw some treats in the next time they go, they're like, Oh my God, it smells like treats. So they dig it up. And then they eat the treat, and then you can just, you know, like, put a treat in before you fill it back up again, keep that cycle going, um, you know, so yeah, you know, you can actually use that to your advantage, you know, if a dog likes to dig, you can take, well, then go ahead, go to work, you know, get yourself exhausted doing that, but um, for the most part, they're, they're going to want to dig in places that you don't want them to, like, so for instance, if you have a garden, they're going to want to dig in the garden, if, uh, you know, you have fencing, they're going to want to dig near the fencing to hopefully get out one time, so um, if it's near the garden, then don't do this trick, because um, dog poop is, you know, generally not healthy for um for plants like let's say a, a vegetarian animal would you know so for instance cows are chewing on grass all day long yeah of course their poo is going to be good for the grass it's basically just they just basically composted you know it for you so it's you know fertilizer whereas uh, anything that is omnivorous or carnivorous and has you know uh, meat in their diet typically the uh, the poo is not going to be too healthy for plants but um, if the dog is digging near uh, fencing, then what you can do is actually, um, when you go to fill in the hole, fill it in um, with some of their poop. And then the next time they go to dig there, a dog naturally won't want to dig through their own feces. So that's one way that you can keep them from trying to dig around the fence. Every time they do, it gets filled in with poop, and pretty soon, hopefully, they get discouraged enough that they try and just dig in the center area that you allocated was okay. Um, in fact, I saw a really cute video of um, a guy, I can't remember which breed dog it was, but it was definitely one that... Um, was bred for digging, and he actually used the dog to help him plant, um, you know, his his garden. So he would go over to a spot, he would point at it, and the dog would dig right there, and he would put the plant in. He would go to the next spot and point at it, and so the dog was absolutely loved. Like like you know, like the the face was relaxed, the tail was wagging. You know, I mean, the, th the thing was panting because it was just getting so much energy out. And I thought that was a brilliant way of dealing with a dog that has those tendencies, and and you and you put him to good use. You know, so um, a tired dog is a well-behaved dog. You know, basically. What's funny is that, you know, there's all of these, uh, you know, training issues and, and all this stuff because, um, you know, previously we, we we had to have dogs for a purpose. I mean, that's an extra mouth to feed. And, you know, if you were living like day to day, that dog needed to serve, serve a purpose in your family in order to have that justify, you know, giving some of your food away to. And unfortunately, that, that's why they usually end up living on, you know, scraps and stuff, you know, back in the day. But um, now we just get them because they're cute, but we're not dealing with the fact that they need a, you know, a function. Uh, to survive and so often if you like I was saying if you have you know a specific breed that you got well you can know what they naturally want to have as their function um, so for instance you know um, getting back to the to the hated dogs uh, one of my absolute all-time favorite dog breeds is uh, the pit bull um, you know and which isn't a breed that's that's a very broad statement but you know you, you know the look you know the big big huge head you know um, you know uh, because of what they have pre previously been used for in the past it, you know, is important for any dog breed to be socialized, you know, at a young age, but for them especially because, um, yes, they, unfortunately, some of the, uh, you know, bull breeds were, were used for un unsavory, you know, practices, so they do have some tendencies. I think the most common one is probably that if you uh, blow in their face, then they tend to have a reaction nip, you know, um, so you just want to do that as often as possible so they kind of just get out of the habit of doing that, but... Um, one thing that, you know, pit bulls were originally bred for, so it's, again, I'm going to get into the dark stuff here, but, you know, um, it was something called bull baiting. And what bull baiting was is that, um, you know, you would have a bull, you would have the cows, uh, you know, to get as much livestock as possible. And once the bull was too um, old to be able to sire, um, you know, to, to breed anymore, then, um, well, you know, they would put it down. But, you know, you can't just put it down. I mean, they didn't have TV back then, so what they would do is they would um, run up their dogs and sick the dog on the bull. It's horrible practice, I know, um, but, you know, basically, you know, uh, you know, if they bit the, the bull on the nose, that was a point, you know, um, or, or something along those lines. And so um, you get to think, well, it, you know, it, when they started breeding dogs specifically for that, you know, to be able to go after a bull, well, that was only, you know, happened once in a while in a town. So 
they would have to, you know, be able to have other functions when they weren't going after the bull. So, you know, you think a pit bull, you think, you know, it's just like, oh, they eat babies. No, it's just the opposite. Actually, they were, the, the, they're the dogs with one of the best off switches. Like, so for instance, if you see, if a dog sees another dog and they go around a corner and they're dragging you trying to get around the corner, you know, like they, they, they don't, they obsess about it for, for a while. Whereas with a pit bull, usually it's out of sight, out of mind. Oh, I want to say hey to the dog. Oh, all right, well, the dog's gone. All right, well, what else? So these are dogs that back in the day, you know, would, uh, you know, go after the bull, go after the bull. They're in a fight in their life. They have blood all over their muzzle. And then as soon as the fight was over, then they would go over back to their, you know, family's kids and, you know, be all lovey-dovey again. It's like the bull's completely, you know, old news by this point, you know. And also, for the most part, it's like, well, we can't just have you for bull baiting. That's not going to be enough to justify a meal. So they would often also be the guard dogs. So that's why they make such great family dogs. <clears throat> um, even if they had never been trained to guard the house ever in their lifetime, you know, you often will hear a news story of, like, you know, the person broke in, the dog, you know, like, uh, you know, took a big chunk out of him, and then they ran off. And it's just like, we've never seen that side of that dog in our entire lives. He's been the sweetest thing ever. I mean, he, you know, we have, like, you know, little ducks, and the dog's super, super sweet with the ducks, like, you know, uh, again, it's just like something that, you know, they have this natural instinct for. So, you know, um, I also uh, said in the previous video, I also knew a pit bull that was a service dog and was great at it. So, you know, that's definitely something that I feel you shouldn't do too much discrimination against uh, a breed, but it is something that you should consider. So, you know, I'm not saying that you shouldn't get a breed because, you know, they have a tendency to do such and such. This is literally just a very, very basic, again, this is dog 101. This is not dog specifics. This is just dog basics where... Um, a breed is a thing to consider when getting a dog, but never should it ever be a deterrent, especially if you do your research and you realize, oh, I was prejudiced for all the wrong reasons. Like, you know, I, I, I you know, heard somebody else say that, you know, they don't like pit bulls because they're vicious and they eat babies. And then, you know, you do a little research and you realize, actually, I don't, I can't find a single news story where there was a pit bull that ate a baby. So I'm not sure what they're talking about. There's this weird dingo story, but that has nothing to do with pit bulls. So, you know, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I wanted to get into. You know, I just... You know, seeing, seeing huskies in the, uh, you know, summertime, which, um, a little off tangent, but, you know, if uh, you ever uh, live in warmer climates and you are taking your dog out for a walk, um, especially if you can't get boots on them to save, save their life, um, you know, when, once you get to the pavement, just put your hand on the pavement. If it's too hot, if it's too hot for you to be able to hold your hand there for a second, it's too hot for their pads. Their, their pads are not these magical, all-purpose, all-weather, you know, like, you know, miracle things. Like, you can actually burn and injured the pads of their uh, feet, and oftentimes dogs won't even let you know that. So, you know, regardless of the breed, even if it was one that was specifically bred for desert or something, I don't know if there are, but, you know, that's just absolutely something to consider, too. I know it's a little off-tangent, but, you know, something that infuriated me, too, when I was living in the desert. I was just seeing all these cold-weather dogs, you know, huge, huge burly, you know, Burmese mountain dogs, you know, like with this super thick coat, you know, and, um, yeah, also, you know, look into, if it is a herding dog, what type of herding it was? Is it one that was supposed to be master and, you know, um, you know, uh, command, you know, or is it supposed to be an independent one? Because the ones that were actually bred to specifically just be without much, you know, um, notice from the uh, owner, they just would kind of take care of the flock on their own. Those ones are going to be a lot harder to train and get you to listen to them because they were literally bred with independence into their mind. Whereas, say, for instance, with a Border Collie, they're definitely supposed to be a command and response, you know, uh, dog. So they're going to be they're going to be very dialed into you, but <laughs> only if you're interesting, you know. Otherwise, they're going to find something else to do because they're just so smart and so energetic. Um, and, yeah, like, again, you know, like, so some of these dogs that, you know, had crazy agility, that, that might determine, you know, what the height of your fence is going to have to be. You know, if you just have a little dachshund, he's, he, you know, he's not going to need very high of a fence, but you might want to do a fence that actually has... Um, quite a bit of it in ground because they're a digger and they're probably going to try to dig. So, you know, you don't necessarily need the height, but you actually might need depth. Uh, and like I said, you know, for um, certain dogs that might not seem it, you know, I think that what I usually tend to see the, you know, most when it comes to mixed breeds that were accidental has, has got to be, you know, um, uh, all the breeds that are, you know, really good at either digging under a fence or jumping over a fence and then patrolling the neighborhood, finding a uh, female in heat, procreating, and then you know you got, you know, uh, you know ha half pit bulls and half half uh, you know labs, half you know German shepherds. Um, you know th that happens a lot. Like when I see mixed breeds, and I was just like, oh, what are they mixed with? And she's like, oh yeah, well that one probably jumped the fence because that's you know they're really good at that. And you probably thought that six feet was fine, but you know as soon as they you know 
smelled it in the air, they were off and gone. So, uh, like I said, I don't really want to get into specifics because I, I think I lost count, you know, once it got into triple digits, how many different dog breeds there have been. Yes, many of them are extinct. Some of them are still not extinct, which is extant, I guess. I just read that word the other day. Um, but, yeah, so over the course of history, there have been so many dog breeds. Some of them are no longer with us. Some of them are very rare. But, um, you know, each one came about usually for a specific reason. So if you get a dog, whether it's mix or not, um, it's not a bad idea to uh, find out. So that's, uh, I want to close with, um, now they actually do have dog DNA tests, and they are getting a lot cheaper. So <clears throat> if you didn't know that that was a thing, or if the last time you looked, it was like upwards of, uh, you know, 500 bucks, well, happy to say that now um, they, they are a lot, lot more reasonable in price, and, you know, what... Whether you have opinions on whether or not you want to do, like, say, a 23andMe on yourself, I think it's really a good idea to get one done for your dog for two reasons. One, if you know what, where they come from as far as the breed goes, again, you can find out some of the um, things that they're going to be predisposed to doing. But also, many of these tests um, will tell you what, excuse me, what genetic um, issues they might have going down the line. They, um, so, some of these uh, DNA tests actually will tell you, it's like, okay, well, you're probably going to see hip dysplasia before too long. Or, you know, enlarged heart conditions is, you know, uh, a big problem in this in this line of family. Um, it's just good to know ahead of time, you know. Um, I mean, if, 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 you know, you get the dog and then you find out after the fact, I mean, it's, you know, good to be prepared because, again, you don't want to be hit with, uh, you know, four hip surgery vet bills that's going to get pretty expensive and probably you hadn't saved for that. You know, if a dog has, uh, you know, predisposition to uh, uh, cancers. I see that a lot in um, some breeds. That It seems like every old dog of that breed that I see has, you know, at least a lot of tumors on them, if not just full on, you know, where they die of cancer, where they die of cancer. So, you know, that's definitely something you want to look into. And now the tools to do that are a lot easier. So if they, they did come from a shelter, which I always recommend adopting, and they don't have their papers, you can now get them for not too uh, unreasonable of a price. It's non-invasive, I believe. It's just the same as with uh, our DNA test. You just do, like, you know, a swab on the inside of their cheek. I'm not sure. I have never actually gotten one done for uh, for mine. But um, it's something I have been thinking about maybe getting, you know, uh, done at some point. You know, we're 98% sure that she's a hound porn mix with some um, pit bull thrown in there. But, um, again, it'd be good to know just in case she might have a predilection towards something that hopefully might even be preventable. You know, so maybe... If she has a predisposition towards, you know, uh, hip issues, then maybe we can just start her in on uh, glucosamine, um, you know, to start off with. So, yeah, definitely, when you're thinking of a dog, consider the breed as a factor. I don't want you to, you know, have that be the end-all, be-all for, for the decisions. And honestly, if you just click that well with the dog that you happen to find, you know, go for it. But just, you know, be aware that um, it's really weird that what we bred them to do generations ago they still have in their DNA without having any outward teachings. Kind of like how a spider, when it grows up, uh, didn't get shown by its you know, uh, mom how to weave a web. It's just built right in. And so we've actually done that to dogs. We've actually bred it into them that they, uh, not always, you know, it doesn't mean that if you have a golden retriever that they're always going to want to bring the ball back. That's not necessarily the case. This is just a warning that quite often um, that is something that will happen where it's just like, okay, I know you're a retriever because, you know, I looked it up online, but, like, how the heck do you know that you enjoy bringing that ball back to me all the time? Some of them, it's just literally born into them because of what they've had in their past. So I just thought that was fascinating, and I thought that that was definitely important to share because um, I, you know, for I, I don't want you to uh, get and then give away a dog because they have behavior issues that you didn't address, and now you're like, well, I can't afford you anymore. Like, you've literally broken through doors, you've you've destroyed, you know, tens of thousands of dollars worth of uh, equipment in the house, you know, I can't have that in a dog, well, you know, that's kind of on you, you know, first of all, for letting it get to that point, but also for not, you know, knowing ahead of time what you're kind of getting into with some of these breeds, so, um, and that, you know, that, that could just be separation anxiety, that's something else entirely, but, um, yeah, and, and for, for the whole... Dog breeds, I've never liked to judge a dog by its breed. I always like to joke that when I was a dog trainer, I would say, you know, I'm, I think one of the, my biggest Achilles heels is dog breeds. There's so many of them that I really only memorize, like, you know, like the, the, the most common basic 10. So if there was ever, like, you know, one that came in that I had no idea, I would just be like, oh, what kind of dog is that? And then immediately forget what I was told. Uh, there's, just, there's just so many to keep track of. So 
I, I never tried to adjust my training too much based on what dog breed. I would usually start off um, the same with every dog that came across, regardless of breed, and then I would adjust accordingly based on what they would tell me, you know, because once you learn how to speak dog, they, they do pretty much kind of yell it at you with their body language and their behavior. And so once they start doing that, then you can adjust accordingly. You know, it's like, oh, you really seem to enjoy the ball as a motivator, but you're not really too keen on treats. Well, that makes sense. You're like half retriever. So why don't we have the ball be the reward instead of using treats and see if we can get you to do the behaviors that we want that way. So yeah, you know, it's just something that uh, to consider. And, you know, again, it's uh, something that you are going to have to do a lot of research on your own. I mean, each breed literally has pages of its own history. So that's why I'm not going to, I'm just doing a couple quick little examples of what I've seen in my travels, but I'm, you know, don't get angry if you're just like, oh, I thought you were going to talk about my breed. You didn't say anything about my breed. Well, because honestly, I'm going to miss at least 90% of them if I tried to get into specifics. But I just think that this is a basic thing to consider when um, being a dog owner. So thanks for listening, and I hope that you take what I say into consideration. Until next time.